Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Peter Barber. I'm primarily a professional opera singer, music producer, and a bass vocalist. And I just had the honor, the privilege, the opportunity to speak with Jeff Castellucci, the modern day bass king. I mean, he he's done such great work as the bass vocalist in voice play, world famous a cappella group. And a few years ago, he transitioned into doing his own solo work, a lot of which are his low bass singer covers, where he takes a song, puts his own super creative spin on it, and just blasts you in the face with his amazing low notes. It was a joy to talk with him, to learn about how he started, to learn about how he approaches his singing, his vocal technique, everything he's done with the voice play, things coming up in the future. It was a great conversation. I am still buzzing, and we got off the horn like an hour ago. Definitely a little bit starstruck by the guy. Um, what a joy this was. I know you guys are going to enjoy it and find value in this interview. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Jeff Castellucci. Let's go ahead and dive into it. So hello to everyone who is watching and listening. This is Jeff Castellucci. It is an absolute honor to have him on the YouTube channel, on the podcast, and I'm going to pass it to him to give allow him to give a little elevator pitch as to who he is and what he is up to these days. Oh, geez. Uh, okay. Well, thanks for having me on. First of all, this is, this is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> congratulations on hidden. Uh, did you already hit a hundred thousand or we're, you... we're about a week away, about a week Dang. away. That's a good feeling. <laughs> yeah. That's a super good feeling. Actually, you know what? We will be there by the time this episode comes out. So nice. <laughs> Happy to hear it. Happy to hear it. Um, yeah, so uh, like Peter said, my my name is uh, Jeff Castellucci. I um, I sing bass in voice play, and I also arrange uh, pretty extensively for voice play as well. And then I also have my own channel, um, which is just Jeff Castellucci on YouTube, which is um, the vast majority of it is uh, bass singer cover music. Um, there are some like little uh slice of life videos in there as well but the majority of it is 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 music and uh i do all the filming arranging production the one thing i don't do is mix but everything else is basically me so that's like a brief synopsis i'm i'm also uh i'm an avid chef and, okay uh, okay and i have a little boy uh he's six years old and i'm married and what else what else is going on um i think <laughs> no, that's that, about it that, that's phenomenal that's a that's a great elevator pitch sometimes when i open the floor to people to give a short little synopsis they end up giving their entire life story and we're already 15 minutes 15 minutes yeah. into the interview elevator so was, pitch you elevator got the ride pitch. up you got you got four floors to tell me what's going on exactly so well yep. done that that is Je jeff castellucci in a nutshell everybody so let's go ahead and and take it back i'd actually be really interested to hear about the origins of voice play. Um, were you there from the beginning? Have you been there from the beginning? When did you guys start? And kind of how did the group progress from where you started to to what it's become now, which is obviously, you know, one of the biggest acapella groups in the world? Um, yeah, well, thank you. I'm glad you think so. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, yeah, I, I was there from the beginning. We, uh, Lane, myself, and Earl, who's no longer with us, but was with us for a very, very long time, um, we started out as a barbershop quartet in high school and, uh, loved barbershop music, loved it, still love barbershop. Who, who doesn't love barbershop, right? It's well, phenomenal. probably, probably lots of people, but they should, they should love it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, we had a barbershop quartet in high school and we started doing, uh, competitions and we, we did pretty well. But we we were a little like, well, there's got to be something more. So we discovered the blenders. Do you know who the blenders are? No, I haven't heard of them. The, they're they're they were. I don't know if they're still around, but they were around when we were coming up in the late '90s. Because I'm old, and uh, <laughs> so we we fell in love with the blenders, and then from the blenders we fell in love with the bobs and take six and rockapella. So we started discovering all this they call it contemporary acapella music at the time. And we started emulating that and we're like, we gotta, we gotta put a show together. So we did. And we sang in front of, there was a bagel shop around the corner from Lane's house. So we, we asked the owner like, Hey, can we, can we do a show here? And they're like, I guess we're not going to pay you anything, but a it's bagel fine. Shop. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, there was no internet. There was no, um, 
there was like nothing. I mean, there was internet, but it was like a trickle, you know, dial up. It's the dial there's no up. U- yeah. There's no YouTube. <laughs> so we were just like singing on street corners. And then we, so we did that. And then we're like, well, that went pretty well. Let's try some, do some more stuff. So we, we did, um, there was a, there's a theater festival here in town in Orlando called the Fringe Festival. And we did that for, it's, it's ongoing. I think Orlando has the oldest continually running Fringe Festival in the U.S., which is so dope. We've awesome. got a really we've got a really thriving theater world down here. So so it's pretty cool. So we did the Fringe Festival for many, many years. And for, like one thing led to the next. People were like, hey, would you come do this? Or we'd get a corporate event. We're right here by Disney. So we'd get, you know, hit up by agents and uh word of mouth spread. And so we 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 it was never like a full time job until I want to say maybe like 2012 or 11. Okay. So that was 10 years of like grinding it out, just doing what we could, <laughs> recording as much as we could. And then um we did a cruise ship, six month contract on a cruise ship. And uh from there we came home and then we did uh we did a couple showcases and we did like some college tours and then we did some uh national tours just based on like there are all kinds of theaters throughout the U.S. that need entertainment. Some are huge, um, some are much smaller, like community theaters. So we would go and we'd play. Um, we were on the road for three, four months at a time. And it was it was rough. I mean, it was fun, <laughs> but you know, it can be <laughs> it was a grind. Difficult. Yeah, it was. And then and then we got asked to be on the sing off um, for season one. Okay, we were. They took eight groups. We were number nine. For season wow. one. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then we kept auditioning every year. We got back on on season. Were we on season three? I can't remember now. I can't remember. I was season four. Because <laughs> there were it four, was season four. Were there four seasons total? There were five seasons total. Five, five seasons. seasons total. Okay. Yep. So the first season, there was a group called Noda, and they won. And then season was season two pentatonics? Or was that season three? I'm no, season two, sure. season two was committed. Season th- you should know all this stuff. Come on, I do your sh- research. No, I should. I should. <laughs> uh yeah. So season <laughs> season three was Pentatonics, season four was home free, and then season five was our buddies. Um they're not together anymore. Uh the exchange. Okay. Um Chris Diaz and, and his boys. They were they were great. But uh but yeah, so the sing off led to the sing off tour one, sing off tour two. And then as we were doing these tours with the sing-off, we were creating um, just a t- as many music videos as we could and um, collaborating with as many different people as we could. And that that kind of like kicked us off in our YouTube career, which I think now we have, I couldn't even tell you how many people we have on. Over a million for sure. Yeah, it's over a million. 1.2 um, maybe, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's and phenomenal. Then, What's funny about that is that is that uh, our YouTube audience grew slower than our Facebook audience. Our Facebook audience exploded. Really? And we had yeah, yeah it was, it's really strange paradigm. Um, so yeah, so so Facebook hit a million way early, and then YouTube just <laughs> dragged behind. We're like, we couldn't we couldn't buy subscribers for like two years, and all of a sudden we hit a million, and it was <laughs> kept going. Just gone since. Well, that that's awesome. Yeah. There there's so many things in there I didn't know about. So. You said the four of you have been together since high school. Four people in the group. Well, t- two of us l- are, who are left, right? So Lane right. and myself. Have, we've actually been buddies since um, middle school, seventh, sixth, or seventh grade. <laughs> Very cool. Oh yeah, yeah. And you're all and you're all based now in Orlando. That is correct. Yep. So, how much work have you guys gotten to do with like Disney or Universal? I, there was a Patreon question that came in about you guys working. Uh, with the theme parks they're doing stuff with the theme parks so what's mm-hmm. the what's the story behind all that we as a group we've never performed in the park for like daily operations that's never been like come see voice play at whatever theater in disney like that's never happened individually we worked for them extensively oh, um, okay like i don't know how much i can say because there's certain things that are like what's well, the disney magic you know <laughs> but but voices have appeared in places okay <laughs> and uh caesar especially has been he's just done everything over there special events and uh um you, you see him on main street all, all the time like he's he's just great um but uh so yeah so the group has never worked for disney 
full time. We've done tons of specialty things. Okay. For them, I'm trying to think of like mm-hmm. what we did recently that was so cool. Um, this just happened. Oh, we did a we did it was a huge, it was a huge uh, like uh, tour tourism agency event. Okay. And they brought in like eight to travel agents from across the country. Let me get probably 6,000 people. And we got to sing um, Bruno. Remember our, oh, our nice. Bruno video? Yeah, that was it's out? fantastic. So we, we did that. But that was the first and only time we've ever performed it. We were like, <laughs> I don't even know if we can pull this off live. <laughs> yeah. But but we did uh, with with uh, with uh, Ashley Diane. And she's amazing. She's wonderful. Yeah. So, so I figure, I mean, when, when you guys, so when you're just speaking on that point, when you're approaching arrangements, because historically you've performed a ton live, I mean, you've moved into kind of the virtual sphere more because of the pandemic, mm-hmm. right? It's like a natural progression, but you guys have to make arrangements that you can reliably do, you know, out on the road in live performances. Um, so how does that affect, I want to come back to some of the other things you just talked about, but while we're on this string here, how does that affect the arranging process? Because they're obviously... There are things you can do in the studio when you have a million chances that you wouldn't want to put in a formal arrangement, or you could put it in the arrangement maybe with an option to do something else. So how how does that work um, as you guys approach the arranging for the group? Um, For us, it's, it's a little easier because we never play acoustic, just never. Okay. Um, Specifically because of the bass and the vocal percussion. Yeah. It's just weird off mic. Like we have certain songs that we'll do off mic, um, but they tend to be more. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? They're not as like rhythm section heavy. They're probably closer to like a chamber choir piece. It's yeah, like, like we're, we're all doing you know stacked harmonies, same yeah. vowel shaping, same words, that kind of stuff. So it so it carries the signal across. Yeah. Um, but if you're asking like, what do we do? So there are certain alternatives we can take. Lane is the absolute worst because he, he, I think we split the arrangements kind of half and half. He gives no, if I can swear, he gives no shits. You can, for, you can swear. For what, for what anybody is actually <laughs> physically capable of. Like he does not care. He, he's like, you're going to sing this and you're going to like it. And I'm like, bro, I can't, I can't do that. Please don't make me do this. And, uh, he he doesn't get, he just makes me do it anyway and i think the extremes of the vocal ranges get get tested continually especially if lane is doing the arranging if i'm doing the arranging it tends to be a little less um push you to your limits okay um but like ellie can just sing anything like he's just <laughs> a gift <laughs> and uh Absolutely. he's he comes from he comes from a a, a pretty um extensive rock singer background like he toured with bands for a while so he just has that like yeah. stamina to go out oh i just love that texture you know i always wanted to be a rock tenor and i ended up as a bass <laughs> and i'm like well, damn it um, <laughs> i'm with you man i like i because i sing opera is my main thing that's all about like hyper vocal efficiency so i've just yes i've never gone down the road of trying to introduce the grit and like the turbulence to the vocal folds but mm-hmm. I love it. It's like one of my favorite things in the world. Yeah. And yeah, it adds so, so cool. much when El- when Ellie busts it out in every arrangement, it's like that is that is an element that just elevates everything happening already. Yeah, there there aren't too it's many really... guys I I know that can do that uh safely and consistently. Yeah. And, and he's got the he's got a neat uh apparatus cuz he can go very clean or very distorted. Yeah, and it doesn't seem to bother him. He actually, he, he was getting a little like, I've got to be doing some damage to myself. So he just went <laughs> and got, uh, he went and got scoped. Yeah, which is everyone's favorite thing to do. Oh yeah, uh, so comfortable. <laughs> but but he's he got the clean bill of health. He's the doctor was like, you you look great, no worries. And I think Amazing. he was a little disappointed by that because he was hoping <laughs> that we were he was going to find something. And then he was like, guys, I can't do that anymore. Can't do it anymore. I'm hit, I'm hurting myself. But <laughs> but no no he was he was all good. Thank goodness. So. So I've always, I've always, my feelings about that kind of singing is I'll never say it's like a, a healthy version of singing, but you can definitely do it sustainably. Like once you yes. get used to it and, and you have all the other parts of technique kind of established. Um, I think mm-hmm. of someone like, I don't know if you know him, but Jonathan Young, who yes. blew up for doing like all these metal covers of stuff. Yep. He's a phenomenal vocalist and he's one of those guys that can, 
he can he can have a super clean tone or he can tap into that like really gritty like metal like singing Mm -hmm. and not hurt himself you know that's incredible there's like uh there's a certain there's like uh, i don't know what you would call it but you gotta you gotta give a little you gotta get a little pain or like discomfort (laughs) to get yeah. the sound that you want like there yeah. are some wonderful singers who have beautiful technique who uh are just like i wish that you would discover a little like dive a little deeper into your pain threshold right. and discover your what you what you really want to sound like yeah which is uh which is something that i, I i've kind of I, I i really enjoy doing especially singing higher uh for sure because i re- i really do love like just that that extra distorted texture yeah and and i have tried to do it many times and then i have to take like two or three days off to recover (laughs) exactly i mean it it is like you do have to push yourself a little bit not so much that you know you have to take too much time off obviously not pushing yourself to an injury but there is amount there's an amount of adaptability your voice can totally Mm -hmm. go under i mean it's probably similar to learning like throat bass or something like something or like a growl like if i try to growl because i don't practice it my voice is gassed immediately but like there are people that can growl for at least you know to record songs like do a Mm -hmm. growl session in a studio like make it that sustainable i can't do it i'm i mean i'm (laughs) absolutely gone a minute if i try to growl yeah it's like it's like it's like it kills you the first thousand times you do it yeah. And then that thousand and one time, that thousand and first time, it's like, oh, this is fine. <laughs> right. Exactly. So you got to do it and do. Yeah. Beatboxers, they're a whole other world. You know, those guys. It, it blows my mind. You know, something really funny, actually. So I, I started beatboxing for fun in like sixth grade. It was before anyone was doing it. And I had a friend that did it. And there was a video of me from the eighth grade talent show that went viral in early YouTube. It had like 1.7 million views. I like there were like local newspapers interviewing me for this and it eventually got taken down because the guy who uploaded it had a Michael Jackson song during the intro. So it got like deeply flagged for copyright. Like you're gone. Channel's gone. Like Mm -hmm. no chance to recover. Um, But I remember like the beatboxing I was doing then was considered good beatboxing. And it is such a joke compared to what guys are doing nowadays. Yeah. Like I'll once in a while I'll go on YouTube and just look up like you know some best beatboxer video or like one of the famous guys from like Swiss beatbox just to see what they're doing and it completely mm-hmm. I don't have a clue how they do almost all the sounds. No, it's, it's a whole other it's a whole other thing. And they uh, every time you come across somebody who you think is great, you're like, oh that that guy's pretty badass. <laughs> yeah, and then you find the next guy who's like ten times as good, <laughs> and like how do, how does this even happen? <laughs> It doesn't know. it doesn't make any sense. Um, OK, cool. So what are some of your favorite moments, favorite performances with voice play, maybe from touring or like specific venues, just like some some big highlights from your your career with them? Yeah, um, <clears throat> geez, we. I mean, we, when we played the sing off tour, the, we were lucky enough to to get to go to the Ryman, which is in Nashville. Amazing. And. Uh, oh yeah i mean just what a great space and um i think we played there i want to say we played there twice and both times it was amazing and we got a standing ovation um at the rhyme and that was really really cool that that's always one that sticks out and then yeah for sure we played um i think it was the lincoln center in new york oh yeah we were we were invited up there was an acapella festival uh, do you know who Deke Sharon is? No, I don't know Deke. Okay, Deke used to be the, um, he was the musical director for the sing-off. And before that, he was in a acapella group called the House Jacks, who you okay. should look up because they're amazing. I've heard of the House Jacks, actually. I have heard yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are so badass. And if you like if you like um, beatboxers, their their drummer, Andrew Chaikin, is literally indistinguishable from a drum kit. Like, it's not it's inhuman he was one of the he was one of the original guys that would that would like do a loop station and he would just what a great phenomenal musician (laughs) super good awesome um anyway so deke invited us up to be part of this he was he was the musical director on the sing-off and he was also the head of the contemporary acapella casa contemporary acapella society of america he was the president of that for like 20 years so 
he has his finger in everything. And now he's like producing TV shows. And he was also, I think he was involved in Pitch Perfect too. I can't remember. Okay. He's yeah. just done it. He's like the guy for acapella. So he invited us up there to sing at the Lincoln Center, which was super badass. We got to sing with um, uh, Matt Sally from Pentatonix uh, awesome. up there. And what, uh, what else have we done? We've sung with 98 Degrees. I don't know if you do. No, no, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you uh-huh. remember Nick Lachey and his boys. Of course. And we've played with Shoshana Bean uh, from Wicked. Um, who? What else have we done? We just we just done lots of stuff. I don't know. Like I, all those are the highlights. I would say. Have you guys toured uh, elsewhere, like in Europe or Asia or or around there anywhere? We never got around. Mm-hmm. You know what's funny is like we could we could probably do it now. But um, I think the desire to be on the road has uh, it has waned a little yeah. bit. We we have we have such a we have such a, um, a, a tight production schedule here in town that being on the road makes hitting all those deadlines extremely difficult. So we. We we have not, if I can answer your okay. question shortly. We, I think we'd love to, <laughs> but it would have to be like the right circumstances. We yeah. we've we've flown to I think we played we played the Philippines for a private event. Oh cool. Um and we've done certain things like, you know, in the Caribbean, uh, but but never never like a an official tour. Okay. So yeah, I mean you guys you guys you guys are pumping out super high quality music videos all the time. Actually, you, you mentioned the busy schedule. Like what is it? What is it like to be in voice play week to week? Not to mention throwing in all your uh, solo projects as well, which I'd love to get into in a minute as well. Right. Uh, that's actually it's a it's a good question and it's it's a painful question. It's <laughs> it's it's difficult. It is difficult to manage. We we have a um, the the three of us, Lane, Ellie, and myself, do. Uh, it's kind of like j- jack of all trades, master of none, right? So like we we, we all can arrange, we all record. We all video edit. Um, I, th- I think Lane does. Lane by far is the best audio engineer out of all of us. He spent a lot of years doing remixes, which I, I feel like I've seen. I've heard you say before that you were either into remixes or doing like EDM or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I used to produce a ton of electronic music back in the yeah, day. Yeah, which is which is so cool. Um, so he, he spent a lot of time doing that. And that kind of spilled over into our um, into our workflow. So like a lot of our music tends to be, you know, re- you can hear remixing. it. You can, you can definitely hear those. Influences yeah. So, so in he's, he's influenced that quite a bit, but okay. then, um, so yeah, so it's tough. We, we, we try to do one, we call it like a, like a tent pole release every month. And then we try to throw some short form content in there as well. Yeah. And it's all like arranged, recorded, engineered, pro- produced, filmed, edited. Like we do it all. And if one person is in charge of the project, like, for example, we just released, um, I can't remember, the last one we did was, was it Valhalla Calling or Seven Nation Army? It Seven Nation matter. Army. I haven't Seven watched Nation the latest Army. one yet because I'll probably be making a video. Oh, okay. It. So Seven Nation Army was, was um, that was my responsibility. So I had to arrange and do everything. And what's funny about that one is that we we had a, a different collaborator um, scheduled to do that one with us. And... Uh, was it three i think three days before we had to film because he was out of he was out of the state couldn't record because uh and then he came back and he was supposed to record his part and um he was like man i'm sick i've been working too much i i can't i can't do it i'm sorry we're like ah so we threw a hail mary <laughs> pass out to um anthony gargiulia uh gargiula because i gargiula. always say it i always say his name <laughs> wrong. um and he's like, yeah, why not? I'll come do it. I'm not doing anything. I'll come do it. So he recorded himself, flew into town, and uh, and that that's the that's the video that you see now is, is Anthony. He did such a good job. Awesome. And he's he's just the coolest cat, old Anthony. He's he's <laughs> very cool. So yeah, so each one of us will head up a project, take it from beginning to end, and we have three or four weeks to do it in. So that that's tough. And it, during all that, like Lane is doing. Uh, stuff for his other channel i'm doing stuff for my channel plus we have all the short form content and then anything on top of that events Hmm. interviews podcasts that kind of thing so it's it's busy um but it's also good you know 
Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, you're, you're busy doing what you love, which is always helpful. Um, that's amazing that you guys in house take care of everything at such a high level. Like it, the, the audio engineering is fun. Like I've always been amazed by the, like the voices just sound so clean. It's all recorded mm-hmm. so well. The mixing's amazing. Mastering's amazing. The videos all look phenomenal. The sets, the costuming. I never would have guessed that you guys were, were taking care of all that. Yeah. It's a real pain in the butt. Um, with the, with the, ex- <laughs> with the exception of the final mix, the final mix is done by uh, a fellow named uh, Ed Boyer. Oh, Ed like Boyer. The, yeah. 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 He yep. did our hide and seek, our last Halloween release, and I oh, think yeah, our, yeah, and yeah. I think our, our hooked okay. on a feeling with with Tim. I think he also edited. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant mixer. Yeah. He's super good and uh, very busy, which is <laughs> which is great. So we always we always try to get him all of our stuff as quickly as we can because we're like Ed, we need we need you to do this, please. Yeah, um, yeah. So so we do we do the vast majority of our uh, the vast majority of it ourselves, and. Uh, and yeah, it is, it is a, it's, it's a grind, you know, but, but so it's, follow, uh, so follow up question because you yeah. guys are, you're a really successful group. Surely you've got some budget. Why not hire out some of the editing to people who either give yourselves more free time or allow you to do more projects or, or do you guys just, you'd like having the in-house kind of control over it where it's like, if, if one of you doesn't like a little thing, you're right there to be like, Oh, can we change this a little bit? As opposed to like sending an email, like we don't like, you know, one minute and 42. Can you like swap this frame for that frame? It, it gets pretty complicated if you're communicating. Over yeah. Distance. There, there is some logistical stuff involved with it, but I think, I think, okay. So it's, that would be twofold. The first, the first part of that is, um we have we've tried to hire editors um and they they don't always have the same sense of urgency that that we need to get it because <laughs> we're always trying to hit that like that patreon oh, time yes. frame I'm, you know? yeah <laughs> so I know that goes. if we don't hit that deadline that's a that's a problem so we usually that's like the time crunch is is one part of it. The second part of it is like we we're, we're not based in L.A. where everybody's a camera guy or, or a video production person. So we uh, there's not like a huge pool of people to, to choose from. Um, so and we just gotten so good at it that we know exactly <laughs> what we need and how to get it done quickly and efficiently and um, cost effectively because we could we could ship off the uh the raw footage to a production house and get something back but it would probably cost us like 10 grand you know yeah. and we can do it ourselves for way way <laughs> way less than that yeah so so that's those those were like the two answers to that question okay fair enough very very cool um let's dive into your solo work so um i believe your was your first project uh bare necessities um i just remember it was i think it was early in the pandemic when you sort of branched and started doing your own solo work in addition to voice play so how did that come up what kind of inspired you to make that jump um you know was there a conversation with voice player you just like hey guys i'm gonna start making some of my own stuff and um because clearly i mean you've kept up all the responsibilities with them just in addition to this new musical journey you're on yeah, yeah, I, 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 uh, I hate myself, so I, I like to give myself as much <laughs> just work as possible. Just dig in the hole. <laughs> I know. You know what? Um, it. I think the very, the very first thing I did was I, I kept getting, I kept getting emails from people who were like, "How do you do this thing? How do you do, um, this vocal effect or that vocal effect or how are you able to sing so high or so low?" So the very, the first thing I did was. A tutorial oh yeah that blew up um, i remember that and it did surprisingly well i had no <laughs> idea i'm like i'm making i'm gonna make this video for 17 people <laughs> and then uh they yeah it just it did really well um and so from i was like oh i guess i guess i should do something else so uh it kind of just kind of like spiraled from there and then i believe you're correct i think bare necessities was the very first piece i put out uh piece of music that i put out and 
yeah that that one did did well too so it just became like well i guess i guess now i have to keep doing this too because it wasn't really a thing that, that i had planned on doing it was like well i have time and i'm not really doing anything else so yeah. i should just do music and just <laughs> right, see what happens right. can't can't hurt um and as far as conversations go i mean yeah we in the reason why my stuff my my music is not a cappella is because if we were going to if i was going to do a cappella music i'll just do it with voice play um so this yeah. is like my outlet for doing m more instrumental things and and um yeah the guys are very supportive they're like this is awesome great Fantastic. and it, it's it's synergistic in a way like <clears throat> people discover me and then they go down the rabbit hole of voice play and then and vice versa yeah, I mean, I think if nothing else, purely for the fact that you are doing non acapella and voice play as acapella, you're going to be able to get some of each audience kind of interested. In there's the a thing. cross, there's a cross pollination thing for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So for your projects, since you do video editing and audio editing for voice play, do you also do all of that for your projects as well? Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Man. Yeah. That's yep. that is a lot. <laughs> it is, is it's a lot, lot. yeah yeah well I, I tend to get help like like ellie will do lighting for me or lane will lane will film um certain things if i mm -hmm. if i need camera movement uh but for the most part yeah it's it's like myself and my wife kathy who is who i think you've been talking to via email yeah yeah um she does all of our she's like the, <clears throat> the manager she's okay. very organized and without her we would be totally lost <laughs> total chaos so so yeah she she helps out a ton and as yeah. far as scheduling for your solo stuff do you have stuff planned out way ahead of time or you just find a new song that you really like and you're like that's the one i'm gonna start chipping away at it and see what happens no i i have <laughs> um i have a i have like a long list of, okay. of music to do and i'm always discovering more but the thing that 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 i the thing that i wrestle with is like and i'm sure it's a thing that you wrestled with too it's like well i really like i really like this song but does anybody else want to see it <laughs> yeah i don't know yeah. and then if they do want to see it then it's like well do they want to see me do it or would they <laughs> rather see voice play do it right well, you know so it's it's like one of these things so i end up committing to a piece of music very late in the game like right I'm like I have to choose a song today otherwise <laughs> I'm not going to be able to make anything happen <laughs> so so it it tends to be kind of I wish I was able to plan better but uh, I I don't okay <laughs> I wish I no. did <laughs> fair enough um so I've been I've been very vocal about this in my analysis I think you do phenomenal hyper hyper creative arrangements you always take a song and really put your own creative spin on it and you really go for it which i have so much respect for so how do you how do you choose kind of or figure out what you're going to do with a song to give it that that jeff spin where it's like you've taken the original you've honored the original but you've made it totally different in some way or added some huge section that was was never there how do you go about finding those things to change some of those things um come about naturally and um uh, both both lane and myself come from a we we listened to um to uh rockapella for decades yeah you know and we we were just we were very very so like their their main arranger scott leonard um who's a phenomenal vocalist great arranger great original songwriter um people who don't know rockapella please look them up they're so good uh they are <laughs> we uh we <clears throat> took cues from their arranging style which is why you will probably never you don't hear a lot of like what's the word i'm looking for like you know like if you listen well and i was gonna say like if you if you uh if you listen to like collegiate acapella and there's nothing wrong with collegiate acapella collegiate acapella is great uh yeah but but you will hear a lot of like weird inventive syllables that maybe <laughs> just aren't the right choice <laughs> like people trying to imitate electric guitars like mm. and they're going wow 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 and like what am i listening to so <laughs> we we tried to we always try to keep things tasteful and creative and one of the things that scott leonard 
does and did so well is he would generally speaking in his arrangements he would write little extra pieces that that went in the song that that were not part of the original but they helped bridge um gaps where instrumentation would have been or your your ear wants to hear it but he gives you something completely new to listen to and so that really influenced i think both i can't speak for lane but i'm going to say it probably influenced him i know it influenced me so when when i'm doing songs like um like 16 tons or uh big bad john or uh house of the rising sun like there's no there's no bridge there's no chorus it's just these songs like repeat there's like there's like an an a section and like a b section and then wash rinse repeat for three or four minutes so yeah. I, I could have just done that and that would have been fine but like what's going to separate people have heard this music have heard this music for decades yeah. <laughs> centuries in some cases you know so it's like i right. gotta do something different to separate this arrangement from what everybody else has heard and so uh i will just sit down and be like i'll just sit and be like um uh, okay so this this uh is it uh house of the rising sun no like ain't no sunshine it's a good example yeah um, yeah everyone knows ain't no sunshine and there's no uh there's no chorus there is a very long bridge for that one that i know i know i know mm -hmm. i know i know i'm like well right. what can i what can i do with that that would that could be a chorus um and then also like what works over the top of that as like a thing that's melodic and catchy so that mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um yeah, so like, exactly. yeah as you just you just sit in a room and you talk to yourself and you sing everything you can think of until you come up with something and then you put it down. I mean, awesome. That's awesome. And how it works. And um, for your, for the production side of things, have you, have you purchased a number of like really nice, like instrumental packs and other things like that? Or are you working? So what program do you, do you work in? Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm a logic guy. Uh, yeah, I, I used to, I think logic's I, great. Logic's great. I used to be pro tools, but it was, I don't know if it still is, but it, Every time I went to open it up and record something, it would crash. And then I would spend like 30 minutes troubleshooting until I got it's it all, to work. It's also like notoriously like an audio only program. Like there are yeah. other programs that do MIDI data better. Yes. I always used Ableton for all the electronic stuff. That's like yep. the go to that all like the dubstep producers are using. Mm -hmm. um, and Logic Pro seems pretty good at both the audio and, yeah. and midi functions it, it also has built-in um you can do like built-in uh transcriptions as well like so you can do sheet music within logic which yeah. i don't believe you can do within pro tools i think avid has their own um suite of tools for that that's ex the external to pro tools sibelius Sibeli sibelius sibelius yeah, that's, that's always what i've used for my arranging yeah ableton um, definitely doesn't have it oh and i should just you haven't asked but i'm going to tell you anyway we we don't chart anything ever awesome so it's it's all just like <laughs> we just sing all the parts yeah and then give out part dominance to everybody because it's just That's, so much at least for us it's so much faster no the bass gang finally kind of wised up and <laughs> started doing that for our latest projects marwan yeah. actually i don't know if you're familiar with marwan he's this hyper talented 18 year old egyptian kid that's just like oh, a, yeah. a phenom yep. and um doesn't read sheet music so he's always just done always just done demos and just made these incredibly genius arrangements just kind mm -hmm. of you know doing it that way which is great so we, we've kind of like taken a, a page out of his book and because it, it 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 does kind of streamline the process for and sure sometimes you can get hung up on the sheet music as opposed to just going in the booth and like recording what you're feeling yeah so well yeah. especially especially when you're um I, I feel like you guys are not all in the same location so we recording, are not <laughs> recording together is like impossible so yep. if you can give the the demo the audio demo like your inflection and like this is where i want it's just easier to hear it and repeat it than it is to read it and interpret yep I definitely think. definitely we are actually meeting for the first time this summer um we've we've raised a bunch of money on kickstarter and we are getting together in the czech republic because that's where tommy and our manager are marwan's flying in from egypt i'm flying in from the states and bobby's flying in from the states and we're getting together to shoot music videos for our next ep coming out so that's very that exciting because awesome. we've, we've been doing stuff virtually for like over two years at this point 
that is going to be so fun. You're probably yeah. going to have some amazing mm. uh, scenery to choose from. Yes, we are. Gosh, I don't know how much I can reveal. I will say that we are we are hoping to rent a castle for a day. Dang. To shoot to shoot at least one of the music videos. That's the only location I'll reveal because I've been I've been very vocal about that on my Patreon and Discord and stuff. Like we might rent the castle. <laughs> That's pretty badass. I think I think if you can rent a castle, like you guys have to like you you're gonna have to get a horse and you're gonna have to joust. It's just <laughs> You just have to. I will definitely pitch that idea you to, uh, <laughs> to the boys. So yeah, we're all we're all really really looking forward to that. We're actually we're figuring out all of like flights and stuff so we can like land at this at the same time basically, and then mm-hmm. we've got our Airbnbs reserved and all that. So it's it's mostly settled. We actually just finished up our demos for the project like this week, so we'll record them so they're all ready to go and you know be lip synced to when we get there all that stuff and the whole team of videographers is in in burno czech republic with our manager and tommy so they're kind of like handling all the logistics of like renting uh locations and stuff like that so it's very exciting it's been a big to do it's going to be totally worth it uh that's awesome at the end um question for you so um how has your voice developed since you were let's say high school and how do you go about um do you practice regularly do you have things in your voice that you're working on and like how has all that kind of progressed throughout your professional singing life i I wish i had a i wish i had a i wish i I wish i had a secret i wish there was a thing (laughs) you know but but there there really isn't um i i i've mentioned this before on several occasions but but I, i would never call myself like a like a natural true base uh i i feel like i have uh like low baritone with with bass range like i have access to lower notes but but i think if you were to like bump into me on the street and we were to have a conversation it would not dawn on you that you don't think so (laughs) no i don't think so like i here's the thing is that that i i know some incredible incredible bases here in town like we have a we have a group at disney called the voices of liberty and uh there's also another one um uh in town voctive and these yeah. guys almost exclusively <clears throat> sing acoustically and their bass uh there were two bases at one point but now i think it's just carl um carl hudson he, you can stand next to him in a room um and he, he just he just talks and your whole body vibrates like he's a yeah. like a freak um tim faust is another one like if mm-hmm. you get to sing with tim faust you know that you are in the presence of somebody who is like truly <laughs> truly gifted i mean just amazing so i i have those notes but it's not in mm-hmm. that way you know? so your just your distinction you make for yourself is you have the notes but it's not with like the the power that you feel like a, a true bass should Correct. have down there yes okay. um and and like i said only because i've 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 gotten the chance to sing with some of these people and i'm like damn i thought i thought i had something but i was wrong <laughs> um so yeah so over over time it has changed like obviously like i'm older now i'm 40 two i'm gonna be 43 this year so <laughs> and think about it for um, a second yeah i've been singing since i was i've been singing bass specifically since high school and i remember vividly on our, our first uh our first mm-hmm. album we did in 99 um i remember singing uh a b below low c yeah and feeling very excited about it. i was like oh my god i can't believe i had a b like that's crazy um but if you had told me then that i would be mm-hmm. singing one two three four five six yeah what like you know like just basically (laughs) i would i would have not believed you yeah like that did not seem possible to me at the time um so yeah so through all of the techniques that i've learned over the years uh the i don't i don't know what you call like the growl or the subharmonic or um uh, just vocal fry in general will that really helped me develop um as a lower singer and i think just i had lots of opportunities to sing like i worked at universal studios for 10 years singing on stage um and and not in a bass range but just like singing 
on stage. Yeah. So uh, that gave me a lot of opportunities and a lot of time to to work on it and develop. Um, and also, when you work at a theme park, you get a lot of notes. You get show directors coming like, hey, man, great show. Please don't ever do that again. <laughs> so I got, you know, I got to really get uh, nitpicked by by some of my superiors. So, so yeah. <laughs> So that's kind of the thing. I have also found that the more I sing, um, like if we're if we're touring a lot, when we used to tour a lot, or if I have to be in the studio a lot, um, things tend to work better. I don't know if you have that same experience um, as a singer, but but like if I take if I take a week off and then I come back to it, it's like ugh. Oh yeah, no, I mean they're not as easy as they were. You know, it functions. It really functions just like the larger skeletal muscles. Like if you take too Mm -hmm. much time off the gym. You're going to be really sore and not as strong when you come back. It's the same same way for the functionality of the voice. I think I would love to give you my two cents on the bass part of your voice because that was one thing the patrons wanted to hear. They're like, I would love to hear you and Jeff talk about whether he's a low baritone or a bass. Okay. <laughs> I think you are I think you are absolutely a true bass. I think there are there are tons of different flavors of the bass voice. For example, have you heard of Glenn Miller? Oh yeah, yes. So he he's the ultimate example of like the freakish basso profundo, and yeah. some people have it in their heads. They're like, "You're not a bass unless you sound like Glenn Miller." And I'm uh-huh. like, Glenn Miller is a one in a billion voice, like yes. literally. Yeah. Um. So I think it's a difference, and this there's a lot of this in like the opera world where you have your voice type, but then you have your specific what's called a Fach. It's in the German Fach system, and it's a very it's when you get really, really specific about exactly what your voice does well, what it doesn't do well, kind of where it opens up. Does your voice have agility? Are you better at long legato singing lines? So you go from like, I'm a bass to I'm a lyric bass baritone or I'm a dramatic basso profundo. They're all under this bass umbrella. There's just a bunch of different kinds of bass. And I would 100%, I would 100% call you a flavor of that <laughs> <laughs> i'm my own flavor i'm like um you are the jeff like, casalucci flavor of low bass butter pecan or <laughs> something boring like vanilla <laughs> no um, no way well i appreciate that thank you yeah man hold hold your head very high you have you really do have a, a magnificent bass voice you really do i'm gonna i'm gonna tell lane you said that so i can be like hey man I, <laughs> yeah. just so you know Peter Barber told me I had a really good baseball. Tell him. I mean, he'll be like, well, he's like, he's going to be like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, voice types and voice classification is like a in vocal analysis is like a whole. It's like my whole thing, like as an opera singer and as my YouTube. So I feel like I generally have a pretty good idea about people's voices. And now no, when you, when you sing, sure. when you sing opera, are you, you always singing acoustically? Oh, yeah. Against. And you four. always have to like project over the whole world. Full orchestra with no microphones. How is that possible? <laughs> Just like it, how? It is absolutely an unnatural, freakish kind of singing. I mean, it really is like full-bodied, healthy yelling. No, I follow-up question to that. Uh, yeah. Obviously, when opera started, there there was not amplification in the way that we have it today. So of why why are they still making you do it that way? <laughs> I I think that might that's kind of why it's like the true, you know, operatic voice, the voice for the big operatic stage has to be able to sing over that orchestra and fill the opera house acoustically. And that's kind of what it's kind of what separates it from everything. It's like it's like the last kind of bastion of like really old school music, yes. um, you know, so. So, yeah, I mean, there are. There are situations when you would use mics if it's like a, if there's some kind of concert performance in like a, a huge arena, you would. But mm-hmm. anyone singing in a real opera house is not going to be using microphones. Um, so, I mean, so much of the battle, so much of the training for opera is to you train long enough and you get the mo- vocal maturity and the heft and the endurance to actually like have a voice that can sing in those environments and especially for basses, it takes a long time to get there. Like basses hit their prime as an opera singer at like 50. Yeah. So the whole sure. time you're kind of building towards these big dramatic roles that you could actually sing against, you know, a big mm-hmm. Verdi orchestra 
or some people like a big Wagnerian orchestra. It's like 80 to 100 pieces. <laughs> In the, you know, it's uh, it's crazy. It's freakish. Um, And the whole thing is you have to be able to do it with endurance. And it's all about vocal efficiency, because the thing about the orchestra is like most of it is is packed into the low frequency. Like the frequency, mm-hmm. even for the high stuff, dives down pretty quickly. So especially as a bass singer, like you, you have to overcome have, yeah, all yeah. of that. You have to have so much cut in the sound while maintaining the body you need to have as a bass singer to where it kind of like the harmonics from the sound kind of soar above it so that even if it's blasting away, you've got enough what you'd call like squealo or cut or whatever to still mm-hmm. be heard against that like huge wall of sound. Dang. Um, it's crazy. And like you said earlier, there are no tricks to it. I mean, every time like young opera singers, I, I like kind of mentor a bunch of like young bass singers. Um in this discord server and they're like you know always asking about like what's the secret how do you do this how do you do that and i'm like you have to do the you have to do the boring work every day where you're just in a practice room singing scales mm-hmm. all different kinds of scales arpeggios to just like build a super solid foundation of like breath support and strength and vocal efficiency and there's no way around it and then you apply that technique to your repertoire and go from there yeah <laughs> yeah i mean that's inc- it's incredible I mean, it's, inc- it's incredible I can't ima- I cannot imagine being asked to do that. I'd be like, you know what? This is this sounds like fun. I'm gonna go get a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be watching. Yeah, I'll be watching from the audience. <laughs> it's cool, man. It's um it's very demanding, but it's also it's a it's a rewarding thing. And I will admit if when you're especially when you're feeling in like really good voice, mm-hmm. and you know how that feels when the voice is just on and you've when got it's all, all the, easy. You've got yeah. all the resonance and everything, and you just know. Like whatever note you're about to sing, you just know you're going to nail it. When you're doing that, like on stage in costume against a full orchestra and you're singing like a big, loud high note, it does feel like a superpower because you're like, I am so loud right now. Like I'm just like <laughs> ripping it, you know, at the at the top of my voice. And that is a that's that's a, a very unique feeling. Cool. That's super good. <laughs> that's a feeling I'll never have. But well, I'm glad you get to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've got. um. Just a few minutes, so I'm going to pop into some Patreon questions, and then we'll uh, we'll try to get you out of here right on time. Sure. Um, so, let's see. Oh, this is from Fiona Jane Brown. She That's has, a cool she, name. Cool name, Fiona. Very, very cool name. She is a uh, Scottish huge fan of, of all the bass singers. She's like a huge supporter of the bass gang and boys play and all these groups. Uh, she's very interactive. And she says, Jeff, who is your favorite of the old gospel singers? And what do you like about their voice? Old gospel singers. It's well, also all the, so we always get these questions like, what's your favorite song? And it's like, it's impossible. Like, yeah, like, it's so tough. many of them. You know? <laughs> um, old, if, if you can count, if she's think if she's talking about like specifically hmm. Southern gospel, then I mean, JD Sumner is like the, the guy. Yeah. Um, George Younce is great um all i these count for sure <laughs> i personally like if you've got to nail me to a wall i would gun to your head jeff i'm Who's gonna on a technicality i'm gonna say tennessee ernie ford okay um, he's done he did a lot of gospel and it's all wonderful i have not actually i've not heard him do that repertoire yeah go go through a deep dive tennessee ernie ford and, and you'll discover okay. that like 16 tons was the was like his hit yeah but it's it might be like the song where he sounds the worst which is such a shame. Okay. All right. I I will I will absolutely do that. All right. Um this is from name is introvert. I'm actually I'm not sure, but this is like their Patreon profile name. I feel you. I'm the same. I'm also introverted. <laughs> we feel you. We feel you on this. Uh what part of your vocal range requires the most care and feeding to maintain? And I already asked you how has this changed over the years. So now let's just say now. Which which part of your voice do you feel maybe takes the most warm up or like the you know let's say you're going into a performance like what part of your voice do you like really want to check and make sure it's like ready to rock before you step on stage? Um, I don't have to do too much in my higher register when I sing live uh, because ninety nine point nine percent of the time I'm singing with voice play and the other guys take care of all that so uh, I just have to make sure that that I have hydrated yeah. and had plenty of sleep if i if i don't get if i don't get enough sleep like i can't count on anything so um, yeah absolutely 
plenty of sleep is is huge when I'm when I have to sing bass. Uh, but if I'm recording here at home or somewhere else, then the thing that I need to pay the closest attention to and warm up the most is the high range because mm-hmm. it does not. It's my favorite place to sing, but it does not come naturally to me. Yeah, this, especially in the way that I want it to sound. Like I have to, I'll do like, and this is not a joke, like mm-hmm. fifty or sixty takes of the same phrase like just to get it like it i need it to sound not like me i need it to sound <laughs> like somebody better than me <laughs> and so, you want the high you also want the high stuff to sound as easy as possible yes you know you don't Which want to be like oh jeff's really reaching for that high g you know, and i you always to... am i <laughs> know <laughs> I'm, I'm the same way on any recording with the bass gang like the arrangements are so crazy because we don't have plans to do them live. So I'll be, you know, belting high A's and stuff like that. And I'm like, no one wants mm-hmm. to hear that. No one wants to hear that live. <laughs> like, Yes, I'll they take, do. I'll take 20 takes in the studio and we'll try to get one that doesn't sound like I'm screaming. <laughs> yep. I know it will. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. We already did from Anna Ray. She wanted to hear us debate whether you're a baritone or a bass. So we, we got into that. Um, And this is one from Miss Chuck Terry. What style of music do you listen to for fun? Or is your brain so full of music from work that you prefer quiet or white noise? Um, I I listen to all kinds of stuff. Um, the, I think the, the one genre I don't spend a lot of time in is like, I don't listen to a lot of pop music, believe it or not. I listen to a ton of, of like really old stuff. Like I love um, uh, kind of like, old jazz or um i I love um like singer songwriter stuff like i'm a huge fan of phineas billy eilish oh my gosh brother yeah um who else i've been listening to a lot uh john i'm gonna just out myself and say john mayer is like one of the finest musicians on planet earth he is love john mayer he is man Um, people don't realize that but especially i have a friend who's uh he's been a working professional guitar player in Nashville for years. And he just raves about John Mayer's guitar playing. Like he's one of the best guitarists in the world. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's never something I would have noticed because to an untrained ear, who's not used to guitar, most of the solos sound like pretty simple. Yes. But it's the not. skill. It's not exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's like part of his magic is making something really difficult sound effortless. Yeah. You know, Dave Matthews is kind of the same. Like he takes really complicated music and makes it really ear friendly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so those those would be the 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 bigger the bigger ones. There's another fella out of Nashville. His name is Ben Rector, who I listen to a lot. Okay, um, yeah. Oh my gosh! I, wait, I love Ben Rector. I've seen I saw him live in Charlottesville, like five or six years ago. Um, yep. Brand new that album that came out in like 2015. It's like so good. One of my favorite albums. Mm-hmm. Phenomenal. Super good. I also saw and, Bill. I also saw Billy Eilish and Phineas in Philly about a year and a half ago. It was dope. really cool. Really cool to see them. Yeah, they're they're freaky. Yeah, the two of them. Such <laughs> good songwriters. Such Absolutely. good songwriters. Absolutely. All right, Jeff. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I think people are going to really enjoy this. Get a lot of value in this. I hope they learn something new about you. And um, any final words to the people who are generous enough who are still listening? Fifty five minutes in. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm, I'm sorry you had to sit through all this. Uh, <laughs> well, no, just congratulations. Congratulations on all your uh, success and your endeavors. I was so happy to be a part of this. And um, thank you for spreading the word. I appreciate you. Of course, man. Super, super great to have you. All right. I will see you soon. Best of luck with everything. All right. See you later. Later. Later.